Okay, so I've opened up the device and it's, uh, it was quite dirty inside. Some sort of a, just sort of black dust. I don't know what it was. Uh, and the reason that I did uh, take the front off is so that I could take the uh, low tape arm off of this, uh, which goes right in that hole. So I've taken it out. Here it is. And the only thing that was really holding it on, um, it, it's not bent or anything. Uh, so the only thing that was holding it on was this screw, um, which is a bit of a problem because when you tighten this down, that sort of implies that this arm should rotate on this axle, um, but it, it doesn't. Rob tries to fix a thing. Rob tries to fix a thing. Yeah. So uh, I'm thinking that maybe what I should do is just remove the lock washer from the top and see if I can take this axle out and uh, see if, you know, maybe it's just like dirty or greasy or, you know, dried up oil or something like that and, you know, maybe put some oil on it and see if uh, that helps because one thing that certainly would not help is tightening this screw up um, because that will just not let this thing rotate at all. So, and I was calling these lock washers. Of course, they're not lock washers. They are uh, circlips, I think. So they fit in this groove right over here. And I can definitely see that there is some white junk buildup in here. Uh, it does feel a little sticky, so I kind of think that I am going to clean this out and clean this and maybe replace it with some uh, sewing machine oil. And we'll see if that allows this thing to swivel nicely. Okay, just a drop or two. That was probably a little too much, but that's okay. Now, uh-huh, yep, that swivels quite nicely. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to work. And that explains why there is a clip here, so that you can put the tape in, and then sit it down on the tape, and then as the tape runs out, this goes lower and lower and lower until it hits the switch. So I removed this thing from here, which was holding this down, so that can be removed. Um, and apparently the only thing that is now holding this are these two screws here. Uh, also, what I wanted to show was in here, right here, see I can push these, and that's what the solenoid will do. And if we look on the other side, so that's how that works. It's just a simple linkage that pushes these things forward. And there's a spring on the back where my hand is that pulls it back off of it. This, it was sitting on these uh, rubber bushings. So apparently this is for vibration. So I was on bitsavers.org uh, because their files are a little bit more organized than on uh, the Internet Archive. Um, and I found this manual, which actually uh, is very virtually a match for the thing that I have. Uh, again, this is a tape reader perforator combination, uh, but the model number here is uh, RA something 612X, uh, X being uh, some number, and mine is an RPS 6122. So this is a, an extremely close match. And what we have are the signals over here, which correspond to the signals that come out of this uh, logic board. So now I have all the signals. Um, in addition, uh, this is also very interesting. We see 
uh, down here that there are actually two modes, uh, mode five and mode six, and that really only says whether the data track uh, outputs for the reader um, are inverted or not. Um, and there is a similar one for the input. Here's the block diagram. Uh, and the interesting thing is it says right down here, perforator logic card 111821, which is exactly the number that I found on the logic card. So that works uh, out perfectly. And this is 111831, which is this other card, which is the uh, perforator driver card. So a perfect match. And here we have uh, some information on the power supply. So we can see that uh, based on our previous measurements, the plus and minus 12 volts were fine. Uh, 34 volts plus or minus two volts, which is uh, just about what I got, except for the 28 plus or minus three volts. And I think I was getting also about uh, 34 or 35 volts. So this is out of spec. Unfortunately, there are no adjustments. Maybe that means that one of the circuit elements is bad. Uh, here we also see that the five volt rail should be 5.2 plus or minus 50 millivolts. That also was out of spec. It was 5.8, uh, but there is a re uh, resistor. There is an adjustment. So I can definitely uh, adjust the voltage on that. Uh, we also have the full uh, circuit diagram for the logic card. And what I was talking about uh, for active high and active low is, uh, let's see, here's the input right along here. Uh, these are the data inputs and we can see that they go through these XORs and the other legs of the XOR are connected to this jumper. And this jumper determines whether the signals here are going to be inverted or not. And that tells us whether these signals are active high or active low. So I should probably search for that jumper uh, to see you know, whether it's enabled or not. And I've removed the logic boards because I'm going to be adjusting their voltage supply. So it would be kind of dangerous to keep them in there. And I've pulled out the power supply a little bit to allow the light to shine into the, the uh, recess so that I can see exactly uh, what I'm connecting to. Uh, here is the plus five volt lamp test point. It is not populated, so I obviously don't have that. And there's another plus five volt lamp over here and another motor supply, which I don't have. Presumably that would go to the reader. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust this potentiometer. All right, adjusting the voltage down to 5.2, good enough. So according to the manual, you should just be able to press the feed button and uh, this thing should just, you know, start pulling tape. But I'm pressing the feed button and nothing is happening. So why is that? So uh, according to the manual, uh, you should again just be able to put the switch in feed and the tape should advance. But it also says that the punch command line must be held in the false state. Uh, now, if we look at the punch command input, that's here, it says it must be held in the false state, which I believe means the inactive position uh, condition. Now there are two modes, like I said before, mode five and mode six. And the way that you set the mode is through this input over here, the punch input mode select, which selects mode five or six. And according to this, uh, a mode five level is going to be open circuit. Now, if we look at the punch command input, we can see that open circuit is active. So what we need to do is tie this input to ground 
in order to make sure that punch command is inactive. Then we should be able to run the feed. So let's do that by putting a jumper into that 25 pin connector and seeing what happens. All right, so I have this fun little DB25 uh, breakout thing with screw terminals. So I've just uh, put a jumper between uh, the punch command, number 11, and uh, one of the grounds, this one is 25. So I'm just gonna plug that into the back, just like that. And uh, apparently I cannot. And that's okay because I've got an enormous cable that I have plugged into the back and plugged into my jumper connector. All right, let's turn this thing on. All right, and let's press feed. Well, I don't think anything's happening. Well, maybe there are some other things that are wrong. Uh, it basically says that the input line is disabled under the following conditions. Punch ready output is inactive or tape error output is active. Here is the punch ready output. That's pin 12. So that should be uh, inactive. Ac that should be active, right? And also tape error output. There is the tape error output on 20, um, which is only applicable for some things. It indicates that the tape from the supply is loose, broken, or tight. And that's interesting because maybe that has something to do with this lever. You know, that it needs to be like over here somewhere. And in addition, this is the tape error output. Uh, which is showing high. So that's the tape error output. And now if I move the switch or if I move the arm, okay, well now I'm getting no tape error. And so that would be the tension arm in this position. And as you continue moving the tension arm, uh, this is the motor. And as we draw more tape, this tension arm will be pulled and then the motor will run, which will let us have more tape, which will lower the tension arm again and stop the motor. And as long as this tension arm is between here and all the way up to about, up to about here, uh, we won't get a tape error. And if the tension is drawn too much, we get another tape error and the motor stops. So uh, this, as far as I can tell, seems to be working. So now what I can do is uh, press tape feed again while holding this in the good position. So I need to uh, get a wire and, you know, hokey something up. Okay, so I've hokeyed something up so that uh, the switch is now in the correct position. And here is the sprocket motor, which is supposed to feed this uh, fake tape that I made. And uh, I'm going to press feed and see what happens. Whoa. Wow. I actually got tape to be punched. And you can see that those are the sprocket holes. So I've put the wheel back and I've noticed another problem is that when I move the tension arm to start the motor up, well, the motor spins, but the wheel does not. And the axle definitely spins, so a fault has developed here. I guess the uh, round bushing is not securely attached to the axle anymore. So this is the part to be replaced. It goes right on here. And it seems to have been um, attached to the axle using nothing but perhaps glue. And we can take this apart. And also, if you look at the part list, um, 
you maybe recognize what this is. It's a grommet. Uh, they're used to go into round holes in sheet metal to protect cables that go through them. Uh, there's one, and there's a second one that fits inside it. We can see that this is the central part that goes over the axis. Um, it appears to be just a piece of plastic of some kind. So I am going to go to the hardware store and let's see, this grommet actually seems to be still pretty round. It's got a few cracks in it. Um, so maybe this is okay, but I'll try to replace it anyway. This one's got a flat spot uh, where it was sitting on the platter for a very, very long time. So I'm definitely going to try to replace this one. Um, so I'll see if I can find some grommets. Uh, this is probably good to go. Um, I will need to attach it to the axle somehow, and I'll probably use JB Weld uh, because it pretty much sticks anything to anything. <laughs> so. Let's see what I can find. Well, I got the three sizes they had. Uh, these seem to be the closest match. This is the spacer. So let's uh, take this out and see how well they fit. Okay, that doesn't seem too bad. Uh, let's uh, give it a test run. Okay, that seems to fit pretty well. And now all I need to do is glue it in place because otherwise it just comes right off. So there's the wheel put back in, and it's been curing for about half an hour or so. And as you can see, uh, it's rotating the shaft, which before it didn't do, because the glue wasn't cured, or the epoxy wasn't cured. And this is the epoxy that I used. JB Weld, it was a uh, clear weld. Now the, uh, the platter can go back on but this axle needs to be lubricated. Uh, I'm touching the axle and there is some sort of a sticky residue on it. So I'm just going to clean that off and put some more grease on it. Now <clears throat> to grease the platter, I use this marine grease. It's, uh, it's actually a blue color and I just put uh, a few little dabs on the axle and it seems to be turning quite nicely. Now I don't know if marine grease is the right thing to do. Um, I'm not a mechanic so I have absolutely no idea what grease is uh, appropriate for what. Uh, there is grease that goes into here and this grease was black so I'm pretty sure that it's not going to be the marine grease because the marine grease is blue. And I guess the color is significant, I guess. Um, when I went to the store, I also saw red tacky grease. That definitely seemed like the wrong thing to use. Uh, so I'm probably just going to use some general purpose grease, which should just be, you know, ordinary black uh, grease. And now I'm just going to check to see that the motor is driving the platter properly. Yep, everything looks pretty good. It stops. Starts again. Okay, well, the next thing to do is to test that I can actually uh, activate the solenoids to punch some data. So I've taken the DB25 cable and run it all the way over to a Raspberry Pi and this breakout board. And I've written a simple Raspberry Pi program in Python, uh, which basically just manipulates the GPIOs and you know does the signals in the proper way. Okay, so I am going to punch a byte with a single bit on it and see what happens. So here we go. All right, that did seem to actually punch something. Um, let me punch um, each bit one after the other, and then we'll see what the pattern we get is. So two, four, eight, 
one zero, two zero, four zero, eight zero, and just for fun, FF. And that should be all of the bits. All right, and let's take a look and see what we got. Um, I will go ahead and press the feed button. Oh, the feed button isn't working. Oh, yes, uh, that's because my program is not properly uh, dropping the line. So here, let me turn this off. Right, and just pull this. All right, so what we can see is that I've got, um, <laughs> I've double punched it apparently. Um, that's quite interesting. Right, so I think the only thing wrong was actually with my program in that at the very end I called GPIO cleanup, which releases all the lines, and apparently that sets the lines to basically a random state or a semi-random state. So I've removed the GPIO cleanup line, and let's now take a look and see if I get all the bits. So we'll punch a zero, 01. Two, four, eight, one zero, two zero, four zero, eight zero, and FF, and zero zero, and FF. Zero zero, of course, shouldn't do anything except punch a sprocket hole. So I'll turn this off now and remove the tape. Here we go. We're still not quite getting things. Uh, this was the area that I punched before. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, oh, okay. I see what's, what's happening. It looks like I overpunched uh, the area that I previously punched, but there is the 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 4, 0, 8. And that would be the um, 1, 0. And then, of course, one of these is the 2, 0. One of these is the 4, 0. There is the 8, 0. This is the FF, 0, and FF. So I do have a working punch. Now, the interesting thing is um, how fast it goes. Um, it is supposed to go uh, 120 characters per second, maybe, or 75 characters per second, maybe, I'm not quite sure. Okay, let's try again. I'm going to print nine characters, this time at a slower rate, and this time I'm printing them at uh, 0.3 seconds, so 300 milliseconds, or about three characters per second. Okay, so that seems to have worked. So now let's see if I go a little faster. Let's go 10 times as fast. All right, that also seems to have worked. So that was uh, 33 characters per second. Let's uh, try to double that. Um, and the reason why I'm saying try is that I'm using Python's time.sleep. This is not a real-time operating system, so, uh, yeah, there is no uh, sure bet here. So this is going at 15 milliseconds per character is about 67 characters per second. Okay, that actually seems to have worked. So let's do 9 milliseconds per character, which is 111 characters per second. All right. So let's uh, remove the paper and see what we got. And we did get a good pattern on all of the tests. So I would say that this could probably go right up to 120 characters per second. So that's that. Um, the only thing remaining is to load a tape, and loading a tape uh, would mean 
uh, testing that the platter is going to move properly and feed tape into the mechanism, which means that I'm going to have to print a lot more bytes. So let's see how that works. Okay, so I have wound the tape around in the specified manner. Okay, and it's just going to come out. I'm not spooling it or anything. And I've placed this arm in roughly the middle position to give it a little bit of tape before the tape actually feeds. And I've written a program to output all 256 characters. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn it on and maybe feed the tape a little bit to make sure that we are pulling the tape properly. So here we go, feeding. Great. And the platter did seem to spin properly and give the tape a little less tension. And this part is where um, we're not actually punching anything out, but this part over here is where we're punching the uh, index holes or you know sprocket holes or whatever they are. So let me go ahead and run the program. Okay, that was 256 characters of data. And that was a lot of chat, it was kind of confetti, and uh, it looks like everything is actually punched properly. So I think probably the next video is going to be about getting the tape reader reading, and then I could actually read this tape, this uh, test tape now, and uh, see if I can read all the characters. So until then, I hope you enjoyed this um, fixing a thing video, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Rob tries to fix a thing. Rob tries to fix a thing, yeah.